The latest visitors to the downtown den were Chris Brady, who's a professor of management and leadership at Salford University, also the author of this fabulous book, Carlo Angelotti, Quiet Leadership. He was joined in the den by Andy McIntyre, who is a director at Sporting Executive Education Agency, DSI. I started off by asking Andy how he thought Premier League football clubs had handled the current crisis and particularly what he thought about Liverpool, Newcastle United and Tottenham furloughing their non-playing staff. Welcome to the Downtown Den to Andy McIntyre, who is uh, Managing Director, Founder of uh, Ed Executive Education uh, Agency, VSI, and Chris Brady, who is a professor at Salford University, um, uh, focusing on management. Uh, business management and leadership, and also the author of, I have to say, two excellent books, um, which are not behind me because I've got them in my hand. So this one, which was my summer reading, which is uh, Carlo Ancelotti, Quiet Leadership, and we'll be talking about Carlo uh, as we uh, get into the conversation, and also previous book, which I've only just started to get into, I have to say, Chris, 90 Minute Management, uh, 90 Minute Manager. Uh, which uh, obviously uh, focuses on, on, on how businesses can potentially learn from uh, some of the great football managers uh, of our time. So we'll get into that conversation, as I say, in a bit. But the first thing I, I wanted to uh, ask you both, and I'll start with you, Andy, if I may, is how football as a business and as a game is coping with the current crisis. I, I think we've seen... Um, 24 hours ago now, a very strong statement come from Premier League footballers about the contribution that they're going to make uh, to the NHS and other char charitable uh, organisations. Um, but then a mixed bag, if I can put it that way, in terms of the way our Premier League football clubs have reacted. So I, I, I'm a little biased here, Andy, as you know, but I think Everton uh, have done supremely well in terms of saying we're not taking advantage of any of the furloughing uh, packages that are available. We're just going to uh, sort our staff out ourselves. Um, but then you had Tottenham, Newcastle and Liverpool, I think, getting themselves into a bit of a PR mess by initially at least saying that they were going to furlough staff and start taking taxpayers' money to prop up their businesses. What was your take on that? Well, VSI Executive Education, of which I am one of two founders, incidentally, Tony Fortner being my esteemed colleague, um, we're in the business of delivering great leaders for a new generation of the sports industry. And I think what we've seen over the last few weeks is that never, there's no, not been a time where we need great leaders more than now, because the football industry hasn't covered itself in glory. I have to say the players should be exonerated from much of that criticism, in my view because I think they've been badly led. Now you've got great examples now of the likes of Jordan Henderson and Marcus Rashford, who've really come to the table and filled a void that's been created by the lack of leadership above them. So I think there's confused messages. So football is like any other business. It has to have cash to pay wages. In an instance like Liverpool, Liverpool has plenty of liquidity, wealthy owners, and the decision to furlough the lower paid non-footballing staff, I think was shocking, a disgrace. They've reversed back on that decision, but whoever made the decision has damaged their brand so substantially that perhaps the owners would like to calculate that in terms of cash, because if you're a sponsor of Liverpool Football Club, you're thinking, really, do we really want to be associated with this when taxpayers' money is being used to fund lower paid non-football employees? while the well-paid and why not why shouldn't the players be well paid i don't think there's any argument about that while the club can afford to pay them they should be paying them but they should be paying all staff but i don't think there's one solution that fits all because every club is so different you know you look at a bournemouth um, i think 80 86 percent of its revenues are dependent on sky tv money now it's a separate question as to whether the industry is fundamentally flawed in having so much dependency on one contract with a broadcaster. But clearly there'll, there'll be a situation where they can't continue playing it. Their, their priorities could be the survival of the club. And in that instance, I think the ownership, as long as the ownership aren't seen to be pocketing uh, 
uh, dividends from huge profits, that to save the club, sensible measures, measures need to be taken. And that applies in any other business, probably other than banking, where in 2008, so many heavily paid bankers did manage to survive despite uh, the mess that they made of the economy. Uh, but there, nevertheless, there were bankers that, that, that cost the jobs. So I think there's, there's two mixed messages. I think footballers should be entitled to make a decision that we think we want to help the NHS. And thankfully, the, the likes of Jordan Henderson, that might pain you, Frank, as a Liverpool fan, and Marcus Rashford have really come to the fore and said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to lead. And they've created an entity, players together, that really can make a difference with them donating money. But money that, that, that at club's discretion, the players' discretion to NHS charities, I think it's fabulous. Um, but the flip side of that coin is where you've got uh, multimillionaires, Mike Ashley, for example, furloughing the Newcastle staff, uh, non-football staff. You've got to ask that, uh, is that appropriate? Is it moral? So the thing that VSI <coughs> tried to do with our leadership programmes is deliver people who are equipped to sit in key roles where they make these decisions better. And uh, we think we've got a very talented alumni of individuals, many of whom have got great performance experience, who are now developing the, the formal leadership skills that will allow that, them to sit in those key roles and make better decisions. And in terms of, um, you made the point there, Andy, football is like any other business. I mean, I would slightly challenge that premise because there aren't hundreds, thousands of businesses out there who just at the start of every year know that they're going to be running at a big loss. And you've rightly focused on the Premier League in terms of your comments so far. But my concern is further down the leagues, Andy, what is going to happen to the 92 professional clubs in England who are going through this crisis now, not getting revenue in, and even with those government packages of support, are still going to be um, basically experiencing huge losses? Well, this again comes back to responsible leadership, doesn't it? Because if you look at the average loss of income for a Division Two team through the season not ending, it's probably around 260, 300,000 pounds because they've had most of their season ticket money and they're relying on walk up at home games uh, plus the away fans. I think when you get into division uh, one, it's nearer 500,000 in the championship, 5 million uh, at loss. So the wider football community, I think, has a responsibility to assist, to assist and sustain those clubs because they're, they're at the fabric of our communities be it Tranmere, be it Macclesfield Town, be it Bolt Wanderers. These clubs are part of our community and we should be helping them. The sports industry, I think, should be helping them survive. But I'd take you back to the Premier League because there's about £1.6 billion in outstanding transfer monies owed by Premier League clubs. Burnley have already made it plain that they could be out of cash in August if the deal isn't done. Uh, to, to get back playing behind closed doors and they have to repay the, the Premier League, uh, the, uh, the money owed to Sky. So I hear what you're saying and I actually think the problem lower down the leagues is more resolvable than some of the challenges that the Premier League are facing. Okay, interesting point. Uh, Chris, if I may come to you and, uh, and welcome to our downtown den. Great to, to see you. Um, a pity that it's in these circumstances. We were hoping to get you to a live event um, in Liverpool not so long ago. I'm sure we'll do that in the future. Um, but looking at the issue of leadership, as Andy's alluded to there, and as I referred as well, well, you know, a bit of a PR disaster for some of those bigger Premier League clubs in terms of the way they initially handled this crisis. Yeah, I, think, I think you're right. It's a PR disaster, but it's, it's interesting when we talk about leadership. I mean, one of the areas where I've been a bit disappointed in terms of leadership and, and to a certain extent, you always have to have a caveat on these type of conversations and say, looking from the outside, yeah, yeah. this is what it looks like. And you don't, obviously, sometimes you don't know what's going on. But, I, you know, I would have thought the PFA could have taken a stronger leadership so that it wasn't left to individual players to try and round up their mates and say, we should do so and so and so and so. You know, and you have to remember that um, the PFA are probably sitting on somewhere in the region of 50 million in terms of reserves as well. So... You know, the, fight, the fact that the PFA were 
were making the comments about tax, tax, you know, we really need our guys to be earning this amount of money so that they can help the NHS with their taxes, which is, um, which is I'm sure what they were all thinking when they took their high wages, you know, but so I was, I was a bit disappointed in their leadership. In terms, of, I think it's interesting that the three clubs that furloughed, uh, Newcastle, Spurs and Liverpool, were one of only 40% of Premier League clubs that are actually in profit. So maybe their business, maybe their business ideas are actually more sensible than everybody else's. Now, in terms of PR, I think Andy's spot on. You know, these things can be handled a lot better. But when we look at when we look down the leagues as well, we've got the same issues going all, all the way down. If you look at the eight clubs in the Premiership that are in profit, all right, they're all spending less than around sixty, between fifty and sixty percent of their revenue on wages. That's it. And then you say, look at somebody like Villa who's losing a lot of money or Everton, Everton losing a lot of money, 85% of their revenue going in wages. Villa, 170% of their revenue going in wages. And then you go down, you go down the leagues and what you're looking at is what every business does. So people say football's not like any other business. Every business has got its own quirks, but businesses are essentially the same. And at certain stages in businesses, you take a risk, um, which I like to call a gamble, right? <laughs> so you're, so you're, if we go back a few years, you're Bournemouth, Bournemouth, right? And you're paying 230% of your revenue on wages to get into the Premier League. You crack it, you stay there a few years, and actually you start to make money, although they're losing again, they're losing money again now. But then you look at, say, Wigan, 220% of their revenue to get up. They couldn't sustain it. They're going back down. They're going to free fall. Now, in, during that period, we could say, oh, well, that's football. There's relegation. Yeah, you're right. But that's the business you're in. You're in a business that has relegation. If, for example, you, um, the Premier League, if we look at the Premier League, for example, if you look at the Premier League and look at the way it works in, in comparison to the NFL, to American football, I mean, people don't know how American football works, but here's how you guarantee a profit, right? There's 32 clubs in the, in the NFL, and the way in which they, they're allowed to spend wages, they're allowed to spend one thirty second, so, you know, because there's 32 of them, one thirty second of 49% of the projected revenue of the entire league. So everybody's always going to be making money, right? And once you have a system where there's relegation and promotion, you've got a problem there because you can't close the league. And so you can't distribute the wages in the same sort of way. And we love the promotion and relegation. Well, if you love the promotion and relegation, you better put up with this because this is how it's going to be for a while. And so um, I lot on the radio to do with to do with Berry, the problem with Berry. And I asked this a caller that called in. And, uh, and basically abused me because I'm a cockney. Um, and <laughs> and it, I think it was on Radio Manchester at the time. Um, but during, during his abuse, I said to the guy, look, how much, do you know how much you earned last year as a club? And he said something like 2.5 million. Or, I can't remember what it was. And I said, actually, no, you only earn 1.8 million. No, no, no. He said, you're wrong. I've seen the book. Two. I said, no, no, you've got 2.5 revenue but something like 600,000 of that was money given to you by the Premier League, basically. And you pissed that up against the wall as well. So, you know, everybody gets given that. You get given the same. If you spend more than you earn, it's, you know, that is really simple business. Now, you know, Andy, Andy will know from our previous conversation, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Mr. McCorber School of, of uh, Finance, you know, if anybody knows their Dickens which is basically you, you earn 20 quid and you spend 19, you're happy. You earn 20 quid and you spend 21, you're miserable. And mm. I'm that miserable guy. So if I'm not earning more than I'm spending, I'm not happy. And a lot of these people appear to be happy to be doing that. And then, and then but that's the gamble, isn't it? Because if you can then gamble, if you gamble, say, for example, like Chelsea did with all of that revenue that Abramovich pumped in, you know, 10 years down the line, you know they're still losing money but they they can they can sustain that and yeah and i think the final point is if you look at the accounts of any any of these businesses virtually all of them 
you'll see a paragraph in the accounts, in, in the accountants, the uh, statement of accounts, which says this business is viable for the next 12 months. And then I'm paraphrasing now, basically, as long as this idiot keeps putting money in, whoever the owner is. <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and I'm like, well, hang on, if this bloke walks away, we could have a problem here. And so, so although I, I take, I take the point that people say, well, it's not like any other business. No business is exactly like any other business, but the basics are pretty much the same. And and I think, you know, football, uh, going back to the original point, though, your original point, which was, you know, about was, was it PR disaster and did they handle it? Well, obviously they didn't, but that's another aspect of business and their reputation, you know, they didn't, they didn't have, handle the Suarez racist thing well. They didn't have, you know, and, and I'm surprised really because... Fenway, Fenway are really good at that sort of thing in the US. I do a lot of work with the US and they're normally really good at that. So it's a bit, it was, it was a bit of a surprise to be honest. I think it was a bit of a surprise to everybody in the football fraternity and, and in the city as well. You know, it, it was the supporters and I think some of the ex-players like uh, Jamie Carragher and Stephen Gerrard yeah, sure. who, who sort of, you know, raised the issue and it was, uh, as you say, the decision was reversed very quickly. Um, it, if I can move into the issue of, of leadership and football management, though, and uh, Andy, I'll come back to you for, uh, for, for a second. Um, we sort of glossed over the Tottenham Hotspur situation because not only did they fall out with a lot of people over their decision to furlough non-playing staff, um, but then we had the situation yesterday where Mourinho is seen out on the training park with the players. I mean, talk about having a bad war. Uh, mm. Tottenham are right up there, aren't they? And, uh, I mean, again, I, I'll probably come to you on this as well, Chris, but, you know, you, you look at a personality, a character like Mourinho, strikes me as being you know, very bright, clearly an articulate guy. What's going on in his head when he makes that sort of decision? It was an astonishing decision, wasn't it? Almost as bad as the advisor to the Scottish uh, government as regards her conduct of travelling an hour <laughs> twice in order to um, visit her, her lavish holiday home on the East Coast. So human beings are flawed and make poor decisions. The, the danger, as I thought, is a poor decision by Mourinho, and it would seem that the club knew about it. But yeah. the danger is that uh, headline writers distract from the core activities of the majority. And yes, Kyle Walker, even worse than, than Mourinho. And, um, my understanding is that Manchester City are likely to deal with that in a significant way. But um, look at some of the more positive player examples. Um, I, I go back to the Rashford and Henderson, the way that they've, they have championed. Uh, and, and I think where they've correctly seen this is, is that they've, they've said, listen, this isn't about us wanting to keep bucket loads of money. This is wanting us, we're going to make a sacrifice. It's got to be for two reasons. One, to help the NHS, or two, to save the existence of the club. And you've got to distinguish between the two. If, if you work for a business and the owners come to you and say, listen, we've got two choices here. We either fold or we all take a 50% pay cut. That's very, that's very different from being a wealthy business owner who comes along and says to you, listen, I want, the, uh, I want you to take a pay cut uh, just because we're in hard times and we use taxpayers' money to fund other elements. So don't distract from the good work that's been done by by football and you hope there's a cultural reset uh, when we start again and we celebrate uh, the work of the likes of Henderson and Rashford um, but, let, but I think the public are significantly turned off by the arrogance of a Carl Walker or Jose Mourinho who thinks football sits separately from any other any other business but there are other people who are breaking uh, the regulations one of the things that Tony and I emphasize at VSI we want leaders who aren't looking to circumnavigate rules and regulations, but we want leaders who are going to apply the spirit of those regulations. And I think there's a, an important difference there. I think I hope the world is one where we, we walk away from the, the type of scandals we've had at UEFA and other sporting organisations, and the responsible leaders want to act in the spirit in which regulations and rules are set. You look, you look at the Harlequin situation, um, uh, sorry, Saracen situation, and, and the, the blatant cheating involved there, the, 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 the salary cap, the blatant breach of the salary cap. People are turned off, I think, particularly in the current climate, 
by people trying to fiddle the system. And hopefully there's a positive outcome to all that's happening here in the generation of leaders that are working with uh, VSI on our MSC for Sporting Directors, our CEO for Sports Organisation, come through with a, a greater level of integrity than has been seen in leaders of the, of the last decade and transform sport. And because sport is at the heart of so many of our communities, people, even in these desperate times, sport features so highly in their thinking. And can you imagine the celebration if the season restarts uh, or a new season even starts in September and the crowds are back? It's a renaissance. It can be a catalyst for the renaissance of the country, not just economically, but spiritually. And leaders should be concentrating on that, not looking to earn a few dollars um, and save a few dollars um, during a period of crisis. Let me turn to the the meat of the discussion for today then. And, and Chris, obviously you've written a couple of books on the subject of football management. Um, I, I'm really impressed in the way you've linked those lessons of management to business and the world of business. Um, I'll talk um, about Carlo in a little while. But your initial book was talking about managers with different styles from different eras as well. Um, so. I think the, the personality question I want to put to you is if Bill Shankly was around today, do you think he would be leading a Liverpool side to the sort of glory that he did back in the 60s and 70s? Or would characters like him and Cluffy and perhaps even Sir Alex be really struggling with the type of personality that has emerged through uh, the different world the football has become? I don't... I don't think so. I think what's uh, sorry. I don't think they would be struggling. I think they would they they would adapt um, primarily because you want to win, and so what, you know what's going to help you win. And so I know Sir Alex has often mentioned as he's he's changed over time, but I think he's changed over time not because he wanted to change over time, but because he looked at the players and said, well, they behave in a slightly different way now. I'm going to have to maybe put up with that, or a Cantona can I'm, I'm probably going to have to put up with that because ultimately, ultimately they want they want to win, they want to succeed. Um, and so so when you look at um, I think Eddie jo Eddie Jones has just said something quite interesting. I was listening to him in a uh, um, on a radio program recently, and he said what what's fascinating to him, and this is where I think your Ferguson's and Shankleys and Paisleys and all that all that crowd and Clough's, this is how I think they would behave. Um, he said if you look at Klopp and Guardiola, he said you can see that in terms of tactics and what they're doing on the field. So during the game, they're absolute command and control. You know, you need to be here on that blade of grass at this second or you're off, right? So that's Mr. Angry. Whistle blows and they're hugging everybody and kissing everybody and doing everything. So they immediately turn from Adolf Hitler to Mother <laughs> Teresa sort of over in, 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 in a split second. and and. I think in it, what Eddie Jones was saying, he said, and obviously Eddie Jones is not very good at it, by the way. Um, what Eddie Jones says is what he admires about them most is their ability to be able to flip like that into those different modes. So they're absolutely rigid about how they want things to play and standards and all those things, which is all shankly. It's all the same type of personality. And then they flip. Now, a Clough might flip by doing weird things or a shankly might flip by doing something else and you know and you can't get two more different characters than Shankly and Paisley you know the, the great quote I've, I've just finished um, I've just finished a book it, it's going to be published sometime next year but unbeknown to many people uh, 2019 is the centenary of the LMA the League Managers Association um, in its various forms it's had loads of forms over the time so what they've done is they commissioned me to write sort of like a history of the evolution of how management evolves so um, you better come back for another day on this because I can talk all day on this. Um, <laughs> but the interesting, the, the interesting quote of um, Paisley was they were saying to Paisley when he took over from Shankly, he said, I don't, I don't really like the line like that much. He said, he said, you know that Bill actually wears hobnail boots so that people can hear him coming. He said, I wear, <laughs> I wear carpet slippers so they don't know I'm there. And they're massively, both massively successful. So yeah. how you get that success can, can, can be different in different personalities. And, and, and I think 
the only difference is that we've really heightened the cult of personality, which is maybe why a Marino thinks he can get away with that sort of thing, you know. And why why these people, you know, why Ferguson was so successful during the period when David Gill was there and, and Wenger was successful when David Dean was there and then maybe things got a bit sloppy when other people came in because they didn't have anybody to answer to. And Marino will never have anybody to answer to. So there was nobody there when he said, I think I'm going to go out on the, on the more. Nobody said, no, you're not. You know, that, that, that. And so you get into that hubris situation where they just think things don't, they, they, they weren't, obviously weren't talking to me, which is what the, the Scottish um, uh, medical person obviously was doing. Well, I've told everybody what to do. I know that's not quite right. I've overdone it a bit there, so I can just nip off. Um, you get into that mindset. And I think that's why you need, at the top level, you need a really good management team to keep each other in check and checks and balances and that. And that's that's the difficult bit, I think. I think that's a great point, Chris, and I'm going to come on to that in a second. But in terms of, you know, good people surrounding themselves with even better people if they can. Um, but the, the other thing that you mentioned there in terms of, you know, the various personalities, but all equally successful. So, as you say, Bill Shankly and Bob Paisley, very different characters and yet equally successful. Paisley, in fact, more successful in terms of trophies won, although many people will still say it was Shanks that brought in the change of the culture of Liverpool and therefore gets an awful lot of credit, and rightly so for that. But when you've been studying managers, what are the particular traits that you've found are consistent? Whatever the different personalities and personas, what underlying factors are there where you would say, yeah, that guy, he's a winner? Yeah, no. Absolutely number one. So, you know, as I said, I've been looking 150 years at these now. So, so absolutely number one, intellectual curiosity. Number one. They're absolutely curious about everything. They want to learn about the game. They, 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 they see that, you know, it's their, it's their life. It's literally their life. And so they, they're always looking for ways to work around things. They're never satisfied. And as soon as where you see managers of a lesser quality getting satisfied then you know that's when they tail off that's when their performance tails off but their performance is never tailed off they went they had little dips and then they'd learn in that little dip and you know you can remember when Shankly and Paisley were talking you know when they moved to, to a more European style because they kept you know because they they turn up against Ajax against a bunch of kids from Holland oh, no problem here get beat 5-1 and, and they come back to the boot room and go, you know, does anybody know what happened yesterday, last night? Because I don't. I, I don't. And, the, and then they sort of say, right, okay, we need to sort this. And so that intellectual curiosity. They're also all workaholics. They all just... And the way I've, the way I've tried to describe it in the book is that they all... That football is effectively their drug of choice. And because <laughs> when you look at... When you look at what happened to Shankly when he just stopped... I mean, he just went down very quickly. And you look at people like, uh, earlier than that, people like Arthur Rowe, people like Alf Ramsey, all these people, they go down really quickly. And this is quite common among elite athletes, you know, because their identity, their personal identity, their views of themselves is tied up with their job. When the job goes, you know, when an athlete gets to 35 or whatever and they stop suddenly, you, you get a lot of problems, you get a lot of uh, mental problems in that era. Mm. And so... Those three things to me, they're, they're, they, they are intellectually curious, they're workaholics, and it's their drug of choice, it's their passion, they can't, they, they can't help themselves. We, you know, and I know you'll go on to Carlo later, which is one of the reasons Carlo was, you know, during his sabbatical year, I, mean, I spent a little bit of time with him during his sabbatical year, and uh, you could tell all the time he was on the phone talking to other football people and stuff like that, he was, he was really missing, really missing it, really missing the game. Uh, Andy, I'll bring you into the conversation at this point because it's relevant to what you guys at VSI are exceptionally good at doing, and that is taking those 35-year-old athletes, perhaps, and getting them ready for a different type of life and, and really bringing their sporting prowess into the world of leadership and management in the world of sport. So there must be an awful lot of what Chris has said that resonates with you there? There is. I mean, we looked, this is seven years ago when we first 
uh, ran a, an MSC for sporting directors. And it was on, on the basis that the industry was A, crying out for modern leaders who could be part of what Chris talked about there, a leadership team as opposed to one individual uh, with, with, with complete autonomy. But we looked at, uh, at creating a talent pool of leaders from really bright, intelligent, uh, highly motivated athletes who previously were drifting out of the game or, or just into coaching. So we wanted to create people capable of sitting as strategic leaders in key positions, typically within the boardroom. And we wanted to stop the, the, the talent drain out of the game, be it in rugby, athletics, football, cricket. So we took people, many people who typically hadn't been in education since the age of 16 because of their performance careers. And we took them into university and started developing their formal leadership skills and the programs that we run, obviously for these people, securing an MSc or an MBA uh, is, is a badge of honor. There's no question about that, but of equal importance, what we wanted to do was get elite former professionals working together, engaging in their own peer group learning within the university or within our non-accredited programs. Um, and then we wanted to bring the top industry leaders into the classroom to work with these people on, on developing their real world skills so that when they leave the university, not only have they got a great chance of getting the right job, but when they get the job, they've got the skill set, knowledge and experience to sit successfully within that role. And what distinguishes them then is that not only have they got this extraordinary performance playing coaching background in many instances, but they've also got the formal leadership skills that mean that they can sit uh, in seats previously occupied by men in blazers with the limited experience of the sporting environment and really contribute to a cultural change. One of the things that Tony and I feel passionately about is changing physically the face, gender, type of people within the boardroom to reflect the wider society and people have to have opportunities in order to get the education. So, you know, we've criticised, Chris was, was, was uh, expressed some criticism of the PFA, for example. PFA have funded members to come and sit on the programmes. Um, so we have to give them credit to that extent as well. I, I share Chris's view that they could have handled things better in the, re in the recent crisis. But I think what we, what we are going to be doing is ramping up our education because what we found is that in these, in these crisis times, we've, we've been, have more applications for programmes than has ever previously been the case. People have stopped, taken stock of their life and their world, and you know what? They want to be part of a group of people that makes sport better and embraces um, maybe new ethics. Um, and certainly we don't see profit as being a dirty word, but profit that's sustainable, not the sort of profit that Chris has alluded to there, where I think uh, Bournemouth have 88% of their income is dependent on, on revenues from Sky. So you, we, we want to see leaders equipped to deliver sustainable uh, economic success for critical parts of our community, our institution. I think for years we've neglected the National Health Service and there were even, even points in time where potentially there was, there was arguments about privatisation. We now cherish our National Health Service and I think forever that will be the case. I hope we also respect and cherish our community football clubs, rugby clubs, cricket clubs and that we get a generation of leaders in place who can make those clubs sustainable for our communities. Thanks, Andy. Uh, now, now, Chris, um, I mentioned at the outset the fabulous book that you've uh, authored with uh, Carlo Ancelotti. Um, it was my holiday reading back in December. I have to say I couldn't put it down. I think I read it within a couple of days. Um, the link between football management and business very strongly made, and we've touched on some of that in the conversation already. Um, but at that stage, of course, he'd been appointed manager of Everton Football Club. Listen, there's no more fanatical Evertonian than me. I think it's the greatest club on the planet. But even I was wowed by the fact that we were able to get the sort of iconic managerial figure that is Carlo Ancelotti. And I suppose the first question I'd ask you, Chris, is to the outside looking in, that doesn't look like a natural cultural fit. But I think you've got a slightly different perspective as far as that's concerned. 
I think um, when, um, obviously when, when it was coming up time for Carlo to leave Napoli, you know, we had long conversations on the phone about, you know, potential areas that, and, and we sort of, you know, you hear in the grapevine and uh, he's very, he's very discreet by the way. So I have to sort of drag stuff out of him. So um, you hear, but you hear in the grapevine that maybe Arsenal are interested, maybe um, Everton are interested. And so, you know, he obviously he's worked in this country before, so he knows the clubs, but he, he also knew I was an Evertonian from, you know, notwithstanding I'm a Cockney, my, my, my family's all from Bootle. So um, they, um, they're all, they're all those, they're all the right sort of people, you know. So, um, what was happening then? So he asked me about Everton specifically, and I said, "Look, you know, there's two two sides to this, as far as I'm concerned. There's one is that Everton, he, he should be looking at Everton in much the same way as he looked at PSG. And a lot of people forget that he was at PSG, and they forget the time that he was at PSG. And the time that he was PSG, when he walked through the door, they didn't have a proper training ground. Uh, there was no canteen for the players." You know, that was, that was the environment he came into. And what he had to do was get a couple of names, you know, big names that he could bring in. That, and, and that included uh, Ibrahimovic and it included Thiago and people like that who were very strong characters and that. And he started to build the club. And then there was a falling out over, over some personal issue. And, and he always regretted the fact that he couldn't do that building job. And so when you read in the papers, everybody's saying, well, is this the right guy? He doesn't build things. You know, he comes in and takes over. Well, he did. And nobody really had made, made the notice of that. And nobody obviously knew that in conversations, Carlo and I, he would say, yeah, he would often go back to that and say, you know, that's my really re regret there. Everything was, everything was going well. The building was happening. They got into the quarterfinals of the, um, of the Champions League for the first time and things were going well. And then, as I say, there was an internal bust up or something. I, I'm never sure. And so when Real Madrid came in for him at that time, he stayed to the end of the season. But when Real Madrid came in for him, he thought it was best to leave because things had not gone well at that particular time. So um, and so people forget that period. So what I was saying to him at the time as we spoke through it was that you need you need to look at Everton like that. And to be honest, I thought the same about Arsenal, to be honest. To be honest. You know, this was a club that needed rebuilding, in, in not, not in the same way in terms of uh, facilities and all that, and the same with Everton, but in terms of rebuilding the culture and resetting the culture and, you know, getting the right type of people around, getting the right type of people in. And I said, it's that sort of job. And I said, if you, you know, I don't know how these things go, whether they actually get interviewed or what they do formally. I said, but if it comes to a conversation, don't forget to remind them about PSG because people might be looking at you and saying, well, you know, Everton, Everton, you know, that obviously at that stage we were, I, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one thing that was amusing. He said um, he was worried about relegation in his reputation. And I said, look, you know, I think we were third from bottom then um, mm. and when, 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 it, when he was being approached. And I said, Carlo, to be honest, they're not that bad. And if you take the job and they go down, it'll be your fault <laughs> because they ain't that they ain't that bad, you know. I said they're just, you know, that's why. By the way, Carla, that's why they need a new manager, you know. And uh, and 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 I genuinely thought that um, there are obviously there are obviously backroom issues and all this sort of stuff that that go with the go with the turf. He knows that sort of thing better than I do, you know. I mean, he's work. I mean. You know, I was saying, look, you know, there's, there, there's there's a half a dozen people who think they run in Everton, and and I said, and uh, I said, but you've worked with Berlusconi and De Laurentiis and and Perez, and, you know, I'm sure you'll be able to manage whatever's going on there. I said, but you know, but there there are problems there, which is why they need a new a new head coach, you know. Uh, and so if you think you're going to come into a Real Madrid with with a different sort of problems, you're not. You're coming into a PSG, and I said, but. You know, you you've always said to me you enjoyed that. You enjoyed the process of being that guy who was responsible for building stuff. And so I, it wasn't quite as much of a. I mean, if again, if I'd have been looking from the outside, I'd have thought, oh, hang on, this, this does this look right? Does this look the right guy? Um, and might have, you know might have gone for for some some a totally different sort of character. 
But I think it's interesting Everton went for him and uh, I hope they didn't go for him just because he's a marquee signing and they went for him for, for who he is because who he is is a good who he is is a good fit. You know, who people think he is might not be such a great fit. Is that it? Can you hear me still? I can hear you, Chris. So we lost Frank. Chris, can I okay. ask you a question? I, I think. Are we all still here? Yeah. I. Oh. Right, Chris? am I back on? You're back on. Yeah, you're yeah, back I, on. I think I'm back on now. I think I got lost. Did you hear any of that, mate? Yeah, I heard all of that. That was <laughs> that, that. That was fine. Thank you. You were fine. I think it was. It was my connection that went down for a second. Get Chris, so you, you talk obviously about the, the club that he's inherited. I don't want to get into the, the structure of Everton because that would be uh, going into territory that um, rightly is confidential and uh, no doubt conversations are happening. What I would say though is that, you know, as a personality, again, the, the name of the book is Quiet Leadership. So again, if we look at some of those previous characters we've referred to, so far, Brian Clough, Bill Shankly, um, and uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. You know, you can well imagine the hairdryer treatment as half time for players, and you know, the kick up the arse when required. Um, you can see it being administered and being administered quite quickly. Carlo, on the other hand, comes across as a very mild mannered, a very considered sort of guy, uh, and I wonder whether he's got that in his locker, and you'll know. Better than most. Oh, yeah. he... oh, yeah. He's got it in his locker. Don't worry about that. Um, the, <laughs> the, the problem is when I was interviewing the players, you know, I'd ask that. I said, because I said, listen, I'm trying to sell a book here and, and it'd be really good if this guy had done something really bad that I could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I said, but, but apparent, apparently he hasn't. Apparently he's, everything, everything's really good about him. And, uh, and uh, Ibrahimovic, for example, said, you know, when he loses it, the problem is, he said, when he loses it, he loses it in Italian. So <laughs> we all just shut up because we just let him get on with it. And then he goes outside, has a quick cigarette somewhere outside and comes back in and it's as, like, it's as if nothing had happened. He said, but he, he can definitely lose it. And he's very, um, I, I remember John Terry saying something interesting. He said, the, 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 um, the training sessions are really, um, if I say low key, it sounds it sounds bad, but he didn't mean it that way. He meant I'm so relaxed. He said, and then Carlo Carlo will say, and I can't remember the exact words he used, but something like Carlo will say something like, "Now we need to be serious," and everybody go right, okay, hang on. And then it was a very intensive period then of, of, of training. You know, it might last forty five minutes, but very very intense. And everybody knew there's no missing about now. You know, this this is you know, this is Carlo's time basically. And then, yeah. then, then he'd let it, then he'd let it relax again. So he can, he can be like that. But what the most impressive thing I found was that we were, and I, I used to be a coach, non-league, you know, but a decent level. So I was a coach myself. So, uh, but I was with him at Real Madrid during during his time at Real Madrid, and we were out on the training pitch, and there was a game going on, and all of a sudden, one of the players just walked off. I won't name any names, but one of the players just walked off, and I, I sort of looked around and said. Carlo, you know, where's he going? And Carlo just went, so I'll leave it there. And, uh, and I thought, well, that, that's odd, you know, if that had been me, I would have immediately had a go at that guy. And, uh, and one of the other players in the session, and, you know, I can tell you who they are later on, but um, one of the other guys in the session uh, had been playing, he had been messing about a bit to a certain extent. So anyway, so after a little while, Carlo says, well, I'm going to go and talk to the guy who walked off now. It says to me, do you want to come with me? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm writing a book here, yeah? So <laughs> off we go to the, and he walks in the dressing room and says to the guy, what's the problem? The guy says, basically that, you know, that so-and-so says, he's not trying out there and, you know, why should I bother? Carlo just says to him really quietly, he said, and I remember exactly, he said, why do you reference the one idiot out there and not the other 20 who are really good quality yeah you because know, Ronaldo all these guys are out there and the, and the guy just goes yeah you're right mister just gets up and walks back onto the pitch so I said so Carl I said that was brilliant he said well how would you have handled it I said well 
The problem is I've had a fight with the bloke on the pitch, and then I've had a fight with the one walking off. I said, which is, pro which is probably why you're at Real Madrid, and I'm in a non-league team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the final point about Carlo, I could talk about him all day because he's quickly become, as you can imagine, a very firm favourite amongst Evertonians. He's just got such a fantastic charisma and he's way got that lovely. He's got that lovely personality like Harry yeah. Catrick. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get, get some, well, when you talk about different personalities, wow, Harry yeah. Catrick and Carlo, they're yeah, your two. Absolutely. Yeah, well, Harry Catrick facing up at the time to Bill Shankly. I mean, talk about chalk and cheese. Oh, no. um, but but the thing is, Chris, you mentioned as well earlier, I'm going to open it up to questions in a moment to, to our participants today. But you mentioned earlier about good people surrounding themselves with great people. And again, two points, really. Um, I think some people saw Duncan Ferguson, despite that brief period of time management, and having a successful stint uh, when Marco Silva left the job as perhaps being the sort of character who wouldn't necessarily be part of Carlo's A-team, if I can put it that way. And then I wonder if you can tell us a bit about his son who's come into the coaching staff. And again, I'm hearing exceptionally good reports about him, Chris, from you know players, ex-players, but also the staff at Everton Football Club who think that we've got a real gem there in terms of Carlo's son on the coaching staff. Yeah, I mean, when I've and a couple couple of times I've seen him coaching, he's he's a very he's a very competent coach. I think he's a he's a really nice he's a really nice guy. And interestingly, when we were discussing if you, you know Duncan Ferguson was obviously an issue uh, with Carlo coming, how he's going to deal with that. Actually, David was the one who uh, first suggested that Duncan was absolutely essential to keep on. So, you know, so he wasn't threatened by, you know, I, I was very impressed with that. I was thinking, you know, because the mm -hmm. young guy coming in, son of, you know, there is all that. You, you can't get away from that. You know, I'm, one of my sons used to play for me and, well, both of my sons used to play for me. And you can't get away from the fact that some people will say, well, he's playing because, you know, because of you or, he, or he's not yeah. playing because you're being too harsh on him or whatever. Yeah. You can't get away. So those conversations are going to happen. But obviously... You know, the fact that David was one of the guys that actually said, you know, this is this this guy needs to be kept on. This guy is important. He's not only is he a sort of a counterbalance to, to Carlo's Carlo's um, character, but he's also a link with the things that we we all love about Everton. You know, not least he's a number nine. You know, it's sort of and that, that those sort of conversations, you know, um, you know, the um, Howard's Way video and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We were first, I said, Carlo, you, you need to watch these because this is that, you know, I, I remember it is, you know, my the first game I ever watched as a kid was the, the Alex Young game when he came back after being dropped for the Blackpool game, you know, when, when uh, Joe Royal was brought in. And the first game I ever saw, my dad took me to, the first game I ever saw was that game. That I said, I Carl, if you want to know about Everton, you just have to ask me. I don't think he trusted that though. I think he, I think he actually asked all the, he actually asked all the guys, all the guys, all the guys there. But um, so I think the, the, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of bringing a whole load of people. And probably if I'd have been, if I'd have been advising, I might have said, you know, maybe one or two guys, which is basically, by the way, what he was told at Chelsea. You know, you can't, you can only bring one or two guys in. And he made do with that, and of course he met other guys like Paul Clement and that, and so, yeah. and so I'm not I'm not a big fan of bringing great big teams along with. You. I think that's what that's what did for David Moyes at United, for example. I, I, I'm I'm not 100 sure of it, but the team that he's brought along have settled in well. They're very similar in character to him as well, so people would people would like them, you know. And keeping Duncan on was important, I think, and keeping a lot of the other Marcel was all, already there, so. I think you know that. I think they've. I think they've got the balance about about right. But a, and, a, and a, but of course, well, well, the only way we'll know is um, is next season, really. And even if even if we finish off this season, is what we'll know. We'll start to know. It all depends when the transfer window comes in. And I think that's another important bit of the business. If if you finish off this season, do you then have a month's pre-season 
uh, during which there's a transfer window. So you enable all the contracts to go through to the end of the season as opposed to 30th of June, because I don't think there's any way we're going to get this finished before the 30th of June. So mm -hmm. do, you, do you say, well, what we do is we extend all the contracts, we'll play the last 10 games out, last eight games out, then we'll have a month break, which will be the transfer window, then we'll kick off. And, and it will be, it'll be the transfer window that's going to be the key. You know, because they're they're clearly, 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 we're not a top four side at the moment, but we're not a bottom four either, which is fine. But that's not that's not what that's not why why the the owners put in the amount of money they're putting in. They don't put it in to finish mid table. No, absolutely. There's some fascinating um, insight into uh, the man, and we can only wish him well. Well, certainly the Evertonians on this call will wish him well. <laughs> And even those who aren't Liverpool supporters, I guess, would wish somebody like Ancelotti well, because, as I say, he comes across as such a great uh, and, uh, and and genuine guy. Um, Andy, final point to you before I open up to, to questions from those with us today. Um, and again, lots of things that Chris has said will resonate with uh, the VSI culture and the way that you teach and surrounding yourself with good people. All those sort of qualities, of course. Um, but equally, I know that you're very mindful of the business and the commercial side of sport. Uh, and therefore, I'd like to ask you, um, just in terms of where the Premier League is at this moment in time, and how do you see them getting out of that conundrum? Do you see them getting out of the conundrum of being able to finish off this season? It's one of the questions that's been asked um, by typed in for, from somebody here. But what's your view on that? Do you think the Premier League will finish this season? Tell you what, I'd be a wealthy man if I had the solution to that problem. I think that I think the season has to be finished, whether it's finished in October or um, slightly earlier. I think the season has to be finished because of the legal complications, the financial issues, contractual issues. It's it's a, a mountainous problem. So I think the league has to be finished. I think you've then then the following year you have to take. A, a real different look. You've got to have some blue sky thinking about how you repair the hole in the industry's finances. It might be that you have to put aside the Carabao Cup in order to have a season finished in time if it doesn't start until October. Maybe one of the solutions around the Sky Broadcasting deal <coughs> is that rather than returning money to them, you open up the three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday, for example, and maybe give them 60 games for free so that every game is televised next season for what it's worth my view is that longer term every game will be televised and it'll be broadcast through an entity such as netflix and people pay 10 quid to watch a live game on a saturday afternoon on the, on the tv but i think it needs um a coordinated uefa and fifa solution because these the, just the transfer outstanding monies that are owed on transfers 1.6 billion is owed by premier league clubs uh, and much of that money is to clubs that sit outside of this country. So by not finishing the leagues, I know the Belgian league has already been uh, ended, but none of the mainstream leagues have. So I think you have to finish it quite how you do it. Um, there's various options of, of adding maybe 10 players to the, uh, to the 25 man registered squad that would come from your 23. So you've got 35 players and you play every three days. That's a potential if you do that behind closed to get it behind closed doors to get it finished. But I certainly wouldn't presume to to um, ha have the the knowledge of the inside track at my fingertips to make that sort of judgment. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to bring people in now. I know Jim Hancock has been uh, patiently waiting to to put a question. There's many others as well looking at the. Um, the, the running order here. We're not going to get through them all, but we'll get through as many as we can. James, can uh, good to see you again. And um, what's your question, sir? Well, it, it, um, Andy's partly answered it. I mean, you know, this question. I mean, he's he's, he's he said he doesn't conceive of it being voided, um, uh, and uh, as it stands, uh, doesn't doesn't really do it. I mean, in Scotland, they are trying to end it by having some calculation on, on, the, on the form during the season. So if uh, Chris or, or Andy wants to come back to that issue, perhaps they could. The, the, other, the other thing I wanted to ask about is this idea, we've got looming up in the distance, the Qatar World Cup in 2022, which itself was going to be very disruptive of the fixture of the season. And there is an idea that we should play the 
21 and 22 seasons starting in the Januaries, and then it would neatly lead up to Qatar and solve the other problem as well. So the, uh, any thoughts that Chris or, or Andy have got on that, I'd be most grateful. The, cal the calculation, Jim, uh, in terms of the points, to a certain extent, uh, and this is not a joke, by the way, is pointless, because um, pretty much pretty much every position, in the, when they did the calculations in Scotland, only one team had slightly changed the position by 0.7 of a point, 0 0.007 in order to then get in terms of the points which then got them into goal difference and the goal difference made, made was the was the deciding factor the problem is when you do that if if there's a team like for example Aston Villa one game behind and if they won that game they would jump but obviously if you do their average over a season they'll get 1.2 points or whatever it is but the chance is that they could win the game and they could get three points, and they'll go straight to they'll go straight to law if you if you do that. That's 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 a that's a difficulty, and um, the so what was the second part, Jim? But the, the, the other the other thing is about the the allocation of seasons with the with the disruption. Oh, yeah. coming twenty two about Qatar. It, it's yeah. peripherally, but you're more of an expert than I am on it. That you could you could have the twenty one season starting next January, the twenty two season starting in the following January, finishing about. In the in sort of September, then then the whatever the Nations Cup or the European Championships, and then and then go into the World Cup in 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 that way. It sort of seems to, in one sense, kill two birds with one stone. But I'm sure I'm simplifying it. Well, I I, I don't think you are. I don't think you are. The, what you're doing, what you're doing, is what I think needs to happen. I'm not saying that that particular solution is the right. What I think we really need is some sort of certainty. And what we're all doing is, saying, well, we don't know when this is going to finish. We don't know what's going to happen here. And so it's very difficult to do any detailed scenario planning because there's so many scenarios. And so you're, you're sort of, you'd have about 50 decision trees that would be, you'd be all over the place. But what, what, I, think can, what I think can happen is if you, if you, let's, for example, we said the season was closed on the 1st of March, right, this year. Um, we're going to reopen it on the 1st of March 2021 and we're going to play the last 10 games and then we're going to, then we're going to start again. Now, there'll be huge problems with that in terms of, you know, and Andy would come in and give us all the commercial problems. The, the advantage of that is there's, there's, a, there's a certainty. So what you can then get together is how we're going to work these problems out. You know, so how are we going to work out that nobody's going to get transferred, that contracts are not going to be expired and so on. So, but you can't work any of that out because there's no decision at all. So nothing. So what everybody's desperate about is, is, is a certainty. Voiding, which I, I, I hate. And my, my son and I, my, my son thinks voiding is the best idea. And, and I, I think it's horrendous. And we argue about it literally on a daily basis. And uh, but at least you got certainty. Bang, we avoided it. It's done, and everybody rouse and everybody goes to court and everything. But it's done, and then we then, then we start on the twentieth of September or whatever. The key is to get some sort of certainty as quickly as we can. Then everybody can start solving the issues of how how we arrive at the first of February or first of October or whatever date you want to pluck out of the air. We're going to start then. The problem we're saying we're going to start on the first of October is. I'm not 100% sure this is going to be done by then. There could be a second wave. But if we said we're going to start 1st of March, which would be a year after we close down, we're on fairly certain ground. We'd still get to Christmas and say, this is not going to work. We've got another six months off or whatever. We, you know, That's the bit we don't know. But at least it gives people the opportunity to plan. And so, and I say, I'm not making that as a solution. I'm saying, at some stage, somebody's got to make a decision so everybody can get around the table and work out how we're going to implement that decision rather than spending months and months. Jesus Christ, we spent three years trying to work out Brexit and nobody mentioned we might have a pandemic at the end of it. <laughs> you know, which, 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 by the way, looks as if it's going to collapse the European Union anyway. So we, we, we wasted three years bugging about with that. Absolutely. Um, listen, I'm going to bring, I'm not going to get Jim onto the issue of the EU. We will be here all day. <laughs> um, lots of people wanting to ask questions. Dave C, Dave, are you around from Cube Residential? Hi, Dave, good to see you, mate. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. sir. Yeah. Um, thanks, Frank. Yeah. Um, Chris, yeah, and Andy's just touched on mine, actually. 
Uh, my question was obviously the way the world is now, the sport and so every sporting event and the whole world of sports took a back seat, understandably. Um, some big events like obviously we've just Grand National just being cancelled, but that was right on top of it. That was in April. Future events like Royal Ascot and obviously now Wimbledon being cancelled, but it seems. The Premier League seem hell-bent on finishing the league and, and obviously everyone needs these contingency plans. As a football fan, a season ticket holder myself, we all want football back. But it almost seems like they are hell-bent on finishing this league by hook or by crook. And what, what's your, You've touched on it, Andy, I know, but Chris, do you think that's purely down to, to money? I think everything's being driven by, by vested interests, and, which includes money, which includes which includes promotion and relegation because we're talking about such big money. And, and I, think, I think the only upside of this is that we, we now even, we now, us football fans know now even more than we ever knew how important football is. <laughs> so, the, so the next time you're in a conversation and some, some idiot goes, I'm not sure how important football is. So just, just remember this. What was on what was on the front page of the newspapers? It was it was that some idiot football manager was out out on, on a park. That was on the front page, you know. So that's how important it is. So that's the good news. But I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right, Dave. It, it's it's driven by the vested interest and it's driven it's driven by money. But as as I say, if we go down your route, Dave, or, Actually, I'll give you my son's phone number. You can talk to him and enjoy enjoy each other's company. But get off the phone now, because if we do, if we go down your route, brilliant. Because it's a decision. You know, it's almost like I don't care what the decision is now. I need a decision so that I can start planning. If I'm the CEO of a club or the CEO of a league, or we need to sort this so that we say this is how we're going to deal with this. And that's, as you quite rightly say, Dave, that's how Wimbledon have done it. That's how they've all done it. They've had a look at it. They've gone, right, the insurance is in place. We can cancel this. We're all right. Let's yeah. get on with bang, done. Yeah. And, and, that, and then now they can start. They've got a whole year to think about how they plan for the next one and make it the best ever Wimbledon and, and you know, and double the revenues and put the prices up because, because we'll all be desperate to get to, yeah. to, because we're I don't think anyone wants to get cancel. Out. No one wants football cancelled or avoided. Yeah. Anyone does. But, I mean... You know, it's almost like there's an air of invincibility about the Premier League. It's all right. We'll play it behind closed doors. To play, even to play it behind closed doors, we don't know timescales if we'll be out of lockdowns and everything else by then. But there's still a lot of people involved in playing a game and a whole host of games behind closed doors. And it's almost like the battering on, fingers in the ears and saying, it's all right, we'll finish it. It's, it's a yeah, weird... you're, you're, you're absolutely right. These, these are the same people, by the way, who said, we'll give it a bit of a suspension till the 3rd of April. I mean, who, <laughs> who the hell, who the hell well, thought that was ever real? You know, yeah. it's, OK, we're going to extend it to the 30th of April. Oh, good luck. <laughs> yeah. it, Andy, it was, can I just... ridiculous. So, sorry, Chris. Andy, just bring it in on that point about the comparison that Dave's made with, with other sports, which is... An interesting one, isn't it? As he rightly says, you know, the Grand Nationals being cancelled, Wimbledon's being cancelled, the Olympic Games have yeah. been cancelled, yeah. and, and you will have you will have athletes who that twelve months. I mean, we've met them, Andy. You know, people who are in the twilight of the careers who built themselves up for that four years have gone and won a gold medal when no one was expecting it in the thirties. People like that now will be looking with their, you know, head in their hands, thinking that 12 months has just killed me. And yet here we are talking about we've got to finish football season. There'll be other athletes coming through who thinks, wow, suddenly I'm going to be nearing my peak. Yeah, I've yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. So I think, I think we're not comparing eggs with eggs. Even when we talk about football, cancelling the Belgian league or cancelling the Scottish league, the financial implications just simply don't compare. With, with the Premier League. So you're talking about a, a broadcasting deal where if clubs don't receive the monies that they're owed from that deal, they could go under. And the, the Italian League and the, and the Spanish League, even with their strength, still don't have the financial clout that the Premier League does. So, yeah, you can cancel Wimbledon and they're insured for that and you can cancel the Grand National. By the way, the ancillary loss to the economies of um, London and Liverpool are gargantuan based, gargantuan based on that decision. I think, Frank, it might have been you that told me every Liverpool home game that's cancelled is worth £30 million to yeah, the yeah. economy of Liverpool. So I, I absolutely get Dave's point. Um, is it unseemly, and it probably is in some respects, unseemly for football to be played behind closed doors to a televised audience while 
we, we've got this dreadful situation in the NHS. And um, so it, there is no ideal solution. But I, I fear that if the, if the league isn't finished, unless we've got some really clever, innovative negotiators and accountants who can do a deal that, uh, that satisfies Sky with maybe extra games in a new season for nothing. Um, there's, there's a financial meltdown, Armageddon on a grand scale. Okay. Um, I've got two questions here about Carlo specifically, Chris. Um, one is, um, what, was, what does Carlo say to players when he meets them for the first time? What are his key messages that he wants to get across? And the second question, why didn't Carlo take the Manchester United job when Sir Alex left? My understanding is that he was their number one choice, despite the media suggesting that Moyes he was. That's from Craig Honeyman. Um, so I don't know which one of those you want to take first. Um, the first thing, the first thing he said, the, the, the only one that I know, I know for a fact, uh, because I interviewed Carlo and the player, was when, um, when he was at AC Milan, he signed um, Nesta from Lazio. And... He'd been, uh, and they used to, interestingly, the Italian national team used to train at Milan's ground uh, for, for international games. And he admitted, he said he'd been tapping up Nesta for years, but Nesta, Nesta was a massive Lazio fan. You know, he was one of these nutters up on the back stands and everything. And, and he, would, he lived, he said, I'll never leave Lazio. Lazio go into economic decline and they have to sell all their best players. So he managed, so he goes to Berlusconi and says, Give me Nesta, I'll give you the European Cup. That was the deal. So, anyway, Nesta turns up and he's Jack the lad, and he's saying, he's, and Carlo said to him, "You're at Milan now. Every game is vital. Every game we have to win." And Nesta said that just that one conversation, he realised he was in a different place. Now I don't know what the conversa exact conversation will be with players coming into different clubs. But you'll have that one simple thing. This is this is where you are now. This is how things are. To toe the line and we're fine. And we'll win. And I'll take you with me a bit, a bit like, you know, a bit like all good leaders. You know, I think we can get to here. I'm confident of that, provided everybody does as they're told. You want to go there? And it's like, yeah. And Nesta said that that just one little conversation when I interviewed him, he remembered it almost word for word, uh, which you know, which was like 20 years later um so he, he he will say he will say something that enables them to understand the culture that he wants immediately and the second question was yes he was like as far as i as far as i know it he was a number one choice for manchester united but it just didn't fit in time twice it didn't fit in time so when he couldn't go because he was going for the um, La Decima with, um, you know, the 10th European Cup for Real Madrid at the time. He was at Real Madrid. So it's not as if they were trying to steal him from somewhere. They were trying to steal him from Real Madrid. And he was there and he wanted to see out the season. And they obviously needed somebody. And um, at the time, um, the, so they got Moyes in. And the idea was that maybe Moyes would last two years like everybody does. And then they'd pick up, they'd go back to Carlo. But uh, Moyes didn't last that long, so they had to get somebody in. By the time the next guy went, Carlo was settled at Bayern, and so it, he missed it. So it was just pure timing, as far as I understand. And I understand that he, as far as I know, and I don't know this from Carlo, by the way, I, I just I just know this, that he was the number one choice. I know him and uh, Ferguson are very close, and so I understand he was he was the number one choice, and he would have probably been a great choice to calm them down for a couple, couple of years while they were changing owner, um, changing CEOs and all that sort of stuff. So he probably would have been an ideal choice for them, you know. Um, but these things don't have the timing, Frank, timing. Listen, Manchester United's loss was uh, very much Everton's gain, so yeah. I'm not going to be crying over that. Listen, <laughs> chaps, we've, we've been on much longer than the hour that we'd uh, anticipated and allocated for this. Um, and it's been a fascinating conversation. We could go on for another hour, I'm sure, but I've, um, I know that uh, people have got other things to do even during the lockdown. And uh, if, like me, 
he probably got a couple of kids in the background as well, screaming and shouting and potentially killing one another. Um, so we're going to close the session there. Um, Chris, as I said earlier, we'd love to get you to a live event in Liverpool sometime soon when this lockdown's all over. It'd be great to uh, to get your thoughts on uh, on how football is going to uh, come back, I suppose, into society, but also see where uh, Everton and Carlo are up to then. And of course, Andy, uh, VSI and Downtown, long-standing relationship and uh, a new way of working for you guys, I guess, at the moment. How how is that uh, affecting your business and, and what are you doing to cope with the lockdown? Well, fortunately, I've got my far more techno-savvy uh, business partner in Tony Fortner, who <laughs> has uh, come up with some fabulous creative ideas. We have the VSI Virtual Pub, where we... Uh, have various guests, including the likes of Stuart Pearce pulling the pints and psychologist Michael Caulfield as our resident landlord. We've got former England and Sheffield United legend Brian Dean sitting in the snug. He has a guest each week uh, and we just chew the fat in the pub and all sorts of issues we've discussed today and we've had some fun because, you know, I think in these harsh times, we forget football has always been fun as well as the passion. So it's, it's in football, it's a, it's a pint in the pub afterwards, cricket, rugby in the pavilion, golf in the 19th hole. So we've been trying to entertain the sports community in VSI's virtual pub. Funny enough, Michael Caulfield has, has, has named it the Shankly Arms after his dog. Um, <laughs> but we're also running more serious webinars in the afternoon where we've had a fabulous array of, of guests who, uh, from the industry who, who've been giving really insightful uh, insights into, into the challenges their particular sector is facing. So uh, we, we, Tony's done a fabulous job in pulling together ideas, technology. Um, and so webinars, online meetings, I'm sick of the sight of Zoom, but I think I've conducted about 17 interviews in the last week on Zoom um, with people applying to come on the programmes. And um, culturally, it's a shift, but it's one that I've found I've got used to. And people are becoming more and more adept at commu communicating in a virtual environment. I interviewed, uh, I, I can't tell you who it is, but a star player um, from the Catalan Dragons this morning who's making a commitment to fly over every six weeks for the two days of study on the MSC for sporting directors. Um, I interviewed somebody in America who was referred to, to us by... Uh, ex an existing delegate who's just become the general manager of Charlotte, the new MLS side. So we've got people uh, who are coming to us despite um, the, the difficulties of the world, and in some respects, maybe because of the difficulties that the world is facing. Mm -hmm. And technology is allowing us to, to interview and more or less carry on business as usual. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for your uh, support with today's event and VSI's sponsorship of today's event. Chris, as I say, an absolute pleasure. And everyone who's joined us this afternoon, I'm sure you Frank, found the discussion Frank, fascinating. Sorry, Chris. Could I just do a quick, a very, very quick shout out? The Everton have said that in the next couple of weeks, they're going to release excerpts from the book being read by ex-celebrity players. So keep oh, Evertonians on the call. Keep an, keep an ear out uh, for that. Um, they've, asked, they've asked me to just give a quick shout out this, today. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to that. And um, uh, lots of things that you see online that you wouldn't ordinarily see. And uh, this morning I noticed it's the 25th anniversary, Chris, of when Everton beat Tottenham Hotspur at Ellen Road 4-1 in that famous FA Cup semi-final victory. We went on to win the Cup with a 1-0 win over Manchester United. Who'd have thought 25 years later we were still waiting for our next major trophy? Hopefully, Carlo will turn that round. Um, we'll certainly send links out um, for that, uh, Chris, if, uh, if the book's being released in that way. If you've not read um, The Quiet, Lead, Quiet Leadership, um, then I would highly recommend it for business leaders. You don't have to be an Evertonian. You don't actually have to be a football fan to get an awful lot of use out of that book. And as I say, we'll hopefully get Chris to a downtown event when the lockdown is over.